Hello and welcome to the all virtual 15th annual Los Angeles Archives Bazaar. I would also like to welcome my fellow panelists, Daniel, James, Abby, Patricia, and Crystal. This platform has allowed us to do the unthinkable and corral Archives Bazaar coordinators from varying regions. All of us have found this event inspirational and it allowed us to share our archives and the work we do in caring for them and making them accessible, as well as getting us out behind from our reference desk and processing rooms and stacks and into the wild public interactive spaces. Next slide. So with that, I will start with the telling of how this event began. Firstly, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Lisa Posas, and I'm the LAS Subject Coordinator. And in 2006, I was part of the first LAS Subject Archives Bazaar. It consisted of, uh, it started by, by 30-ish people working to build a directory of less visible archives about Los Angeles. Um, and they thought it would be a good idea to show off each other's collection. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> so the show and tell turned into a public gathering at the Huntington Library on November 4, 2006, uh, which uh, will go on in history as the first ever Archives Bazaar. I was there, as I said, and it probably will be the only time in my life where I can earnestly apply the phrase, if you build it, they will come. The bazaar was built and to everyone's surprise, they came. It was the longest string of reference interviews I ever encounter encountered. Needless to say, the success of the event formally made it the annual Los Angeles Archives Bazaar. Next slide. And by year three, we moved to a conference center that allowed us for more exhibitor booth and programming for the day. Next slide. By year five, we moved to the USC Doheny Library, a 1930 building designed with Italian Romanesque architecture. Whether it's due to the building itself or the juxtaposition of this Hogwarts-like structure set around the luminosity of archives, the Doheny no doubt injected a new energetic ambiance. And yes, those are actual owls in the library. One is real and one is not. You decide on that. Next slide. Uh, the one before that? Yes, thank you. Also in year five or um, 2010, the LA Subject Executive Committee. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, next slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the LA Subject Executive Committee established the Avery Clayton Spirit Award. Avery, well known and well liked, passed away suddenly and too soon. With unmatched energy, he championed the African American collection his mother and retired UCLA librarian Mame A. Clayton started. This annual award is given to those who embody Avery's spirit of dedication, enthusiasm, and generosity. This year, we honor Guadalupe Rosales. Um, uh, who uses Instagram as a platform to document Latinx youth culture in Southern California. Through her archives, Veterans y Rucas, and Map Points, she is ensuring that community memory is preserved. Next slide. In year five, we also start to build a brand, if you will, or a look. You get the point. Next slide. We also use this event shamelessly to plug LA subject grant funded projects that went beyond the bazaar and help the archive community in sustainable ways. We showcase projects funded by Cal California Humanities, the Institute of Library and Museum Services, and the California State Library. Next slide. The 10th anniversary of the Archives Bazaar and 20th anniversary of LA Subject became the impetus of the History Keepers exhibit series featuring LA Subject member collections and was held at El Pueblo de Los Angeles, where LA began when 44 settlers of Native American, African, Filipino, and European heritage journeyed more than 1,000 miles from Mexico and established a farming settlement in 1781. Next slide. Jessica Howe, imaged here, is the visionary of this series and shepherded the installation for the first three years. Workshops and tours were held during the fourth and fifth years instead of a physical exhibit to assist members in preparing for an installation for this year's anniversary celebration. 
Then COVID hit. Um, but like the Archives Bazaar, Bazaar, History Keepers was not deterred. When I think of home, Images of LA Archives online History Keepers exhibit features 55 organizations and individual collections and can be linked to from the Archives Bazaar website. Next slide. The Archives Bazaar became a great place to test out collabs as well with grassroots uh, groups like Los Angeles Preservation Network, Basement Tape Stays, and Home Movie Day Los Angeles, all of which are participants this year. We've also given space to the National Archives and their National History Day efforts and local LA companies like Luna Imaging and Angel City Press. And we even did one year a Wikipedia edathon, which was a spaghetti noodle that didn't quite stick to the wall. Next slide. But we kept on building and pep people kept on coming, young and old, the curious, traditional scholars and neighborhood communities alike. The bazaar is stressful to set up, no doubt, but the event is where people could not only learn and celebrate archives, but also engage with each other in superbly wondrous ways. Next slide. Even with these current times of empty chairs and empty tables, we still chose to move forward. Uh, next slide, one, because that 2020 is the 15th anniversary of the Archives Bazaar and the 25th anniversary of LAS subject, as I mentioned before, but also because trying or building things to see what would happen is part of our Archives Bazaar DNA. Thank you. And next up is Daniel. Thank you, Lisa. You're um, welcome. <laughs> I, I just want to echo Lisa's sentiment that if you build it, they, they will come. The Austin Archives Bazaar began in 2014. And we, the Archivists of Central Texas, were looking for an outreach opportunity. And uh, one of the founders, Jennifer Hecker, uh, wanted to do something very big to bring the entire community together. And she told us about the LA Archives Bazaar and after a couple of meetings, um, we decided to run with it with a steering committee of about six people. And our Archives Bazaar is a little different from everyone else's in that it's biennial because as Lisa also mentioned, the, the planning of it can be uh, difficult and um, uh, time exhausting. So we've, you know, we take a year off and then we spend a year doing the planning. So what is the Archives Bazaar? Um, the Austin Archives Bazaar, as you can see, it has grown in 2014, 2016, and 2018 into a fairly large event. It is, um, as is common with most of these events, it consists mainly of uh, a huge ballroom where all the different archives, all the different repositories table, and they have a uh, they have their space for general information, or they have, sorry not or, but and archivists on hand to answer questions. And it's an opportunity for them to show off their best material. Uh, in Austin, it's always been a challenge because we require having an indoor and outdoor space. Our outdoor space is used for uh, short talks by authors who use archives in their work. Um, we have an oral history component to it where participants can sign up in advance and do an oral history while they're at the bazaar and then also uh, take in all the other repositories and uh, all the other uh, speaking engagements as well. Uh, one of the things that we also do is we have a photo booth, an old time photo booth, and we provide costuming. Could I get the next slide, please? We provide some of the costumes. They're 19, generally 19th century accessories. The uh, photograph is, is printed on site, it's black and white, and then it's affixed to um, a carte de feast cardstock. And I'm putting it in my hand because I don't have one. This is where it would be. And then we uh, supply participants with crayons and markers and they can hand tint it themselves. We also have a preservation table where members of the public can bring in their own material, their own personal stuff. Uh, sorry, personal archives, and they can get consultations with conservative professionals, sorry, conservative professionals, conservation professionals and archivists. In addition to that, inside of the ballroom, we project silent movies featured by the Texas Archive of the Moving Image. 
um, in 2018, we added a, uh, a little bit of local flair. We printed a historic map of Austin. It was about 12 feet by 12 feet. And then what we had was um, we had postcards on one side and on the back there was a question and it asked you where in Austin this particular place was and the participants had to try to figure out where it was on the map. Um, we also, but you know, of course we wanted to make this fun. So we've, uh, we've had, every year we've had a, a signature cocktail that you could purchase at the bar. Um, the, we sourced those from local archives. The Austin History Center had a couple of uh, recipes for cocktails that were not too far off the mark, not too strange, not too out there, but, but very good. Uh, we've, um, we have a, a raffle in which sponsors donate um, material goods, uh, sometimes gift certificates, things like that. And it's a great way, uh, honestly, to get um, a lot of email addresses to keep people, sort of to keep the participant list growing over, over time. But a lot of there's often a lot of uh, raffle prizes. And so I'd say like, it's, it's not nearly a third of the people that enter the raffle end up winning something. And they're very happy about that. In addition, our sponsors provide uh, goodie bags that, that are not just um, general information, but uh, it can be, and I'm forgetting now, but it can be a lot of things, uh, a lot of interesting things, uh, either from the repository or from a sponsor. Um, We again, I'm sorry, let me go back. Uh, so in addition to those uh, three things, I'm sorry. Um, so as you can see, if I could go back to the previous slide. So in our first year, we had, we were very shocked and very surprised that we had about 400 attendees. Uh, in that, at that time, we, we managed to get about 21 local repositories it from Central Texas. So it isn't just Austin, but it's mainly Austin, but it's also, it also goes all the way to Waco and all the way down to San Antonio. Um, and in the second year, we had 26. In 2018, we had nearly 30. And I think this year we would have had about 30 if we, if it not, if it had not been canceled. Um, I would like, let's see, sponsors. We have, we've, as you can see, the sponsorship has grown. It takes, uh, it takes a lot of money to put on an Archives Bazaar. Um, we were surprised to find that out, but uh, what was great about it is, uh, is that we have been able to grow our sponsorship every year. And it means that the venue that uh, we have it at can be bigger and bigger. This year would have been the biggest um, venue. And I know I keep saying that and it's sad, but it is true. Um, this year would have been very different. So I would also like to just quickly end by saying that um, like the LA Archives Bazaar, the Austin Archives Bazaar runs on volunteers and we usually have about 35 this, on, that, on the day of, and we have a lot of people planning behind the scenes, about 20 people. And I just wanted to thank them while I was here. And I will uh, just say uh, that's it for my time and I'll happy to take any questions and thank you for having me. Thank you. Next up is James. Didn't really create formal uh, <laughs> introductions. We're just gonna go one after the other. Hi, uh, my name is James Williamson. Um, I'm representing the DFW Archives Bazaar. Um, DFW stands for Dallas-Fort Worth, which is the metropolitan area that our bazaar covers. If you hear me use Metroplex and DFW or metropolitan area, they're all interchangeable. It's just how we roll. Um, next slide, please. So the DFW Archives Bazaar uh, 
the the seed for the idea began in 2017 when uh, three institutions, the uh, Southern Methodist University, the Dallas Holocaust Museum, and the Dallas Public Library uh, decided to host a all-day uh, preservation workshop. Um, we were inspired by the Austin Archives Bazaar, but um, didn't really know if this was an idea that would take hold in the DFW area. So we started off small with this preservation workshop and this collaboration between three uh, institutions. Uh, but once, once we had that workshop uh, and it proved to be a success, we decided, okay, next year is the year that we're actually gonna try to put it on a archives bazaar. Um, given the size of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, um, it was decided that uh, the bazaar would move between major cities um, where uh, each city would add its own certain flavor and also opportunities for different participating institutions. Um, one, of the, one of the things that kind of unique, well, not unique, but kind of the kind of bumps that we had to work with is even though Dallas considers itself kind of this large DFW area, um, the pockets within it tend to stay uh, where they're at. So if you're in Fort Worth, you tend to do Fort Worth only uh, projects and events and you don't make your way an hour to Dallas. So, um, but the bazaar, as I'll talk a little bit later, is, is one of those ways of kind of correcting that kind of behavior. So, um, the first bazaar was held at the Dallas Heritage Village in 2018 with 29 institutions. Um, the idea was to provide as much free um, things as possible. So attendees were given free access to um, the Heritage Village as well as uh, lots of swag and free beer taking inspiration uh, from Austin. Uh, we may not do cocktails well, but in Dallas Fort Worth, we do do beer very well. Um, and that um, we had over uh, 200 attendees. Um, we took over uh, several of the buildings in the Heritage Village. So with one building being for um, institutions, uh, second building, which was a church we used for our speaker series, which seemed very natural. And then another building where we have what we call our archival experience, which is really um, Booth's designed to provide archival advice on preservation, digitization, conducting oral histories, and career advice as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, the second year proved to be even bigger. Um, in 2019, we hosted the Bazaar in Denton, Texas, um, which Denton is a college town with a large university and an active library school that provided an opportunity to draw in even more attendees. We had over 300 attendees. It also allowed us to increase our volunteers and bring in a lot more student volunteers, which I think was really great. Um, one of the things that kind of came out of that is the student volunteers, when we maybe had an institution that did not show up to the bazaar, could jump in and actually um, present their class projects as part of the DFW Archives Bazaar. So it wasn't just, um, just institutions in their collections. We were able to find a way to incorporate the, the library school students. Um, this year was supposed to be set in Fort Worth at the Fort Worth Stockyards, but obviously um, <laughs> that was changed. And so we moved the bazaar online. Instead of doing a one day event, um, we've basically been using Archives Month as a way to celebrate archives every day. So every day um, a dedicated institution um, presents material um, from their collections, offers the resources that they've created through our various social media channels. And then we, as the DFW Archives Bazaar Committee, um, provide um, Ask Archivist live sessions. Um, we've coordinated with participating institutions to share um, workshops that they had already had planned for Archives Month. Um, which used to be insular and you'd have to sign up. Now these workshops are being live broadcast on our social media channels. But hopefully 2021, we'll be back at the Fort Worth Stockyards. Um, next slide. 
<laughs> so they just some scenes from Bizarre. Obviously, the beer guy was very popular. Um, it was just a, a great opportunity. Every year, um, we try to be flexible with um, the things that we're doing. Um, we obviously let the town that we're in and the venues that are available to us to kind of shape the bazaar and what we can. So one year we didn't have a speaker series. Um, another year uh, we did. Um, we, we have a lot to consider um, since the Dallas Fort Worth area is quite large and public transportation is wouldn't say the best. Um, we have to be considerate of the buildings that we choose and parking situations, what what we're sharing, the areas, what, um, what surrounds these buildings, we have to consider that as well. So um, uh, next slide. So just some takeaways from, from this whole Archives Bazaar experience. Um, like I said, there was very limited interactions between institutions outside of their respective cities. We do have a, an archivist group similar to the Central um, Texas Archivist Group. Um, but when meetings are held in specific towns, if you were to go to that meeting, it's usually only populated by institutions from that town. So it's not a, it doesn't encompass a wide area. And this was really the first time that that we were really able to do that successfully. And also gave us a greater understanding of who um, is out there and what kind of collections are out there. Um, just because when you work with specific institutions, they know people who can then come in. So um, Last year in Denton, um, University of North Texas works as a LGBTQ collection. So we were able to bring in a number of LGBTQ archives into the bazaar. Um, and that wouldn't have happened um, if we had kind of, if we hadn't moved around. Um, but each year the steering committee works really hard to include diverse representatives from libraries, museums, archives. We, we wanna have, make sure we have representation from both big and small institutions and of course, um, what these institutions specialize in. There are some logistic things that we are considering as we move forward. Um, we have been doing this every year um, and our, our fundraising efforts have been successful so far. And I think most of the institutions um, in the DFW area have seen, has seen the DFW Archives Bazaar as a good investment, but we'd be curious to see how long that lasts, especially since we host it every year. Um, and then as we've expanded, we've had to put more and more money um, the first DFW Archives Bazaar was done on a pretty uh, small budget with most of everything being donated in kind. So Dallas, Dallas Heritage Village allowing to use their space was a donation in kind. Tables were donated in kind. Next year, we had to actually pay rent and we had to pay for our tables and things like that. So um, I think as we expand and as we want to do more things, we're going to have to be uh, very conscious of how money affects that. Um, but overall, I think it's been a great experience and, and we're seeing a lot of the things that other Archives Bazaar has seen. And I know Daniel, Daniel mentioned, you know, this, this great interaction. It's absolutely been the same for us. Interaction between each other as archivists and as institutions and with the public. Thank you. Oh. Abby's up next. Well, good afternoon. Thank you to Lisa and the LA Archives Bazaar for inviting me to participate on this panel. Um, I've enjoyed hearing about everyone's bazaars so far. And uh, my comments uh, definitely echo Jane's. Uh, I'm Abby Weiser, and I am representing the Border Archives Bazaar. Our bazaar is organized by the Border Regional Archives Group, but we mostly go by our acronym, BRAG. Our members are from far west Texas, southern New Mexico, and northern Chihuahua, specifically Ciudad Juarez. BRAG is an informal organization. Uh, we don't have any officers or committees. Uh, because there are so few archivists in our region, 
Uh, we were open to non-archivists, and I have a feeling archivists are actually in the minority in our group. Um, so we have librarians, museum curators, a firefighter, and other people just interested in archives and historic preservation. The idea of the Border Archives Bazaar came from Dennis Daly. He's the head of special collections at New Mexico State University, and he was inspired by the Austin Archives Bazaar. Our first bazaar in 2017 was at the New Mexico Farm and Ranch Museum in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And you can see some photos from the event on the slide. Uh, it was a great venue for our size, and most importantly, it was free and had lots of free parking. The following year, we had the event in El Paso at the University of Texas at El Paso Student Union. And then in 2019, we were back in Las Cruces at the Farm and Ranch. All of our venues have been free to brag, which allowed us to put on the event with no money. Um, because Bragg has no money, <laughs> we applied to the Society of Southwest Archivists Community Outreach Fund. And we asked for, uh, I believe, $300 to $400 uh, every year. And that money went towards advertising. And we used it specifically to um, purchase uh, postcard mailers. And you can see that uh, our first mailer, uh, postcard mailers on the slide. And the front just had general information. And then the back of the postcard had more information explaining the event, more details, since of course it was a new endeavor. Uh, we also advertise on our social media sites and some members of Bragg have been on the local history uh, radio show every year to promote the event. Uh, our first bazaar, we were lucky, we actually received um, free press coverage and uh, one of our members is actually a journalist at the El Paso Times. So she writes a nice article before the uh, event as well for free. Uh, we have 16 to 20 institutions participate each year including the University of Texas at El Paso Special Collections, uh, where I work, uh, New Mexico State University Special Collections, the El Paso Public Library, the Tularosa Historical Society, uh, White Sands Missile Range, uh, the Doña Ana County Clerk's Office, and the New Mexico Space History Museum. Uh, each institution has about one to two tables where uh, items from collections or promotional uh, materials are displayed. Um, institutions can also bring swag um, to give away. So we usually, from UTEP, we take um, free bookmarks, UTEP library pencils, um, and people seem to enjoy that, especially the bookmarks. Um, we've also included scanning stations and preservation advice at our bazaar, but those actually haven't been very popular. Um, people are mainly interested in the displays. Um, as well as the talks um, that we have each year on uh, local history and archives topics, but especially local history, people seem to be most interested in uh, those talks. Our speakers are local historians and uh, Bragg members. Last year, we had 275 people uh, attend the bazaar in Las Cruces, which we felt was a great turnout for a smaller city. Uh, we were also able to rent, uh, well not rent, but book the theater uh, at the Farm and Ranch Museum. So we were able to show two films from our archives, um, La Venganza de Pancho Villa from UTEP, uh, University of Texas at El Paso, and The Devil's Mistress, uh, which is from New Mexico State University Special Collections. And those were also very popular with attendees. Uh, the Bazaar has been an important outreach event for us, uh, and it's also been a great way for us to meet other archivists and learn about each other's collections, since we are spread out so geographically. And that's, that's it for my section. Thank you. And last but not least, our neighbors <laughs> from down south, from Orange County, Patricia and Crystal. Good afternoon. My name is Crystal Tribbett and I am the curator for Orange County Regional History for UC Irvine Library Special Collections and Archives. And I'm joined today by my colleague Patricia Prestonary, Archivist and Special Collections Librarian at Cal State Fullerton. And we will speak to you about our work on the Orange County Archives Bazaar. Next slide, please. 
In early 2018, Patricia and I had the opportunity to meet and discovered that we both had an interest in developing a public program that could highlight the lesser known history of Orange County. We had each participated in local history events, which we enjoyed, uh, but we noticed two things. At these events, libraries and community organizations rarely, if ever, showcased actual materials from their collections. And the histories discussed often focused on older, maybe pre-70s Orange County history. Uh, we, we recognize a lot has changed in the county's history in the last 50 years, including its demographics, industries and landscape and wanted to highlight those. And with this in mind, we set out to convince a few others to help us plan a bazaar. In this slide, you see Patricia and I, along with Lizeth Ramirez, formerly from Orange Public Library, Annie Tang from Chapman University, and Chloe Van Strahlendorf from Anaheim Public Library. Um, we set our goals high for putting on, event, uh, putting on an event by the fall of the same year. Next slide, please. And so Orange County Archives in Action was born. We originally decided not to call it a bazaar. Our thinking was to set ourselves apart from the LA Bazaar and to help articulate the role of archives in helping to fill in the gaps of region's history. Um, here you see our first flyer. Uh, we had several priorities for the event. We wanted it to be welcoming to all the cultural heritage organizations in the region. And to do so, we chose not to emphasize the involvement of the universities participating. We wanted it to be in a location where exhibitors felt comfortable bringing original materials. And we wanted it to be free to the public. Next slide. The venue was the most important and challenging aspect of planning. We looked for a venue that would be centrally located, um, neutral, and I think legitimate in the sense that it would help solidify the significance of the event and the value we placed on our cultural heritage community. We found a willing partner in the Bowers Museum, which is located in Santa Ana. The Bowers agreed to charge us the price of an educational program and to advertise to its members through its newsletter and social media. It also agreed to provide exhibitors with free on-site parking and allow event goers to um, enter the museum at a discounted price. We benefited from the Bowers foot traffic. Even people who had not heard of the event were able to attend. The planning committee um, requested funding and other contributions from our organizations. Um, I know I use UCI Library's stated uh, commitment to supporting the Orange County community as a reason for us to financially support archives in action. Other contributions from the organizations came in the form of printing, swag, and labor. Um, students enjoyed a work, uh, working the event. Regarding the program, we aimed for a variety of speakers with various affiliations to the cultural heritage community. We also looked for presenters who could speak on a range of topics that fit our vision. For example, we had talks by well-known regional historians, academic librarians, and those working in nonprofits. Uh, we really leaned on our relationships with these individuals to convince them to participate. Next slide. The event was a success. We had over 25 exhibitors and about 200 visitors. We received great feedback from exhibitors and excitement about the next year's bazaar. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Patricia Prestonary. And um, continuing on with the 2019 Archive Bazaar, uh, we were encouraged uh, by the positive feedback we received for the first bazaar. And we embarked on planning for the second with a goal of replicating the first, as well as offering thematic programming. One of our planning committee members, Liza Ramirez, accepted a job in Los Angeles. And we managed to recruit another volunteer from the Santa Ana Public Library's history room, Dylan Almendral. Our favorite venue, the Bowers Museum, was unable to give us the same educational discount as the previous year. Thankfully, the Hilbert Museum of California Art offered their gallery space in between installations, which meant we could redirect funds to marketing and promotional spending. Next. As part of our marketing strategy, we decided to simplify the name of the event and to name the planning committee Archives in Action with the intention of expanding the group's activities beyond the annual bazaar in the future and to include other areas of um, 
conservation and preservation in Orange County in addition to archives. Our organizational logo was introduced on the press release announcing the 2019 Orange County Archives Bazaar. Next. The group's connections to Santa Ana, the Santa Ana arts community supported the concept proposed by Crystal to explore the history of Orange County's murals and invite community members to share their histories and current activities. We promoted the event on Facebook to great effect. Using Facebook, we reached the Orange County historical community directly, asked our uh, exhibitors to also promote the event to their members. And we were really pleased with the event's attendance, which was over 220. Next. In addition to hosting 28 exhibitors, we offered art workshops, three presentations by local historians and artists, a walking tour to Emigdio Vasquez's mural, El Proletariado de Aztlan, which was walking distance from the Hilbert Museum, and a reception with live music. The Atwood Mural Project, a 260-foot restoration of artist Manuel Hernandez Trujillo's work, brought a 26-foot long scale model on flat stretched canvas to the event, which corresponded well with the screening of Dancing with the Sun, the artwork of Manuel Hernandez Trujillo and his family's presentation that day. Next. Um, moving forward, the, the biggest challenge it has been in the past and will be securing a location. Um, it's especially challenging to find a venue that meets our lofty goals of being centrally located, neutral, uh, or unaffiliated with the committee's institutions, um, low to no cost, um, that offers free parking and offers enough indoor space to accommodate over 30 exhibitors and speakers. Uh, I think in the future, too, we would look to, as I mentioned before, to expanding um, our reach to other groups that are doing preservation and conservation work in Orange County. Um, next. Uh, for 2021 and 2020 and 2021, rather, it was difficult to plan for, with so much uncertainty, all volunteer organizers and budget cuts in our institution. We hope to resume the bazaar in 2021, if not in an outdoor venue, then virtually with the Los Angeles Archives Bazaar as a model, of course. Um, despite these obstacles, we plan on resuming next year because this event serves as a reunion for many, um, a place to make new connections for some folks, and one of the few occasions in which we celebrate our local cultural heritage institutions who are often taken for granted or overlooked. So that's the end of mine. Happy to answer any other. There's a lot more that uh, Crystal and I wanted to say, but I um, have to wrap that quickly. So uh, happy to answer any other questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll uh, we'll go straight to question and answers. Uh, and so, uh, Patricia and Crystal, you will have uh, you know time. We we are in good time right now. It's three. 38 um, and we have a few minutes for some questions um susie i i i'm able to monitor the questions okay so you don't have to get on if you if you don't because it's um <laughs> unless i'm missing something but uh, one of the questions is for uh daniel about the ransom center and if you've partnered with them uh yes the ransom center has been um represented in every archives bazaar and it would have been in the, the 2020 as well and i wanted to add uh beyond the hrc uh we one of the things about the austin archives bazaar is that it it's it's very diverse in repository we have you know small shops very small shops as far as um we have very small shops such as the austin independent school district all the way up to the hrc and i i failed to mention that during my initial spiel but um Yes, they have been there, as well as uh, many, many others. Great. And I do want to say that um, I forgot to mention that, or maybe I, I mentioned it in the beginning, that originally Oklahoma 
uh, was going to join us, uh, but uh, she couldn't make it, unfortunately. But uh, I did take a peek at her slides. So I can say that I know that the Oklahoma Archives Bazaar started in 2017, and um, they've had one since 2017 and 2019. And although I didn't memorize her slides, I do recall it was curious that in Hearst, they also, they too also had a scanning booth. And I believe if I read her bullets correctly, they got zero scans. <laughs> so it, it looks like scanning is not a popular activity, at least with Oklahoma and Dallas Fort Worth. So now that all of you have heard about a little bit about each of us, how, did you do you have any takeaways of what's been successful across the board and not successful? Is somebody going to talk? <laughs> well, I, I was going to say that's kind of a hard one. And it, it, it's it's hard to know because the regions are very different. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a very large state. Uh, we had talked about doing scanning on demand um, at the Archives Bazaars, but between 2014 and now, the the um, I think somebody in the previous uh, session before us said uh, that smartphones really do a very good job nowadays of capturing that information. And I know that that may or not be, you know, a, it, I don't even think that's a controversial thing to say anymore. Uh, the, the difference between a smartphone in 2014 and a smartphone now is uh, is very, very different. And I, I don't know that even, I, I can see why a scanning program would not necessarily be uh, something that people would want anymore. Yeah. Um, we also too had beer. And that was successful. But James, were you about to say something? So, so for Dallas Fort Worth, um, our scanning, we, it wasn't like a scanning on demand. It was more like, um, like a scanning booth as an exhibitor. So, you know, we really went more over technique and different tools and different components and different types of scanners. And we if anybody wanted to do scanning on demand, they could, but it was more of, of an educational booth. And, and, and in that regard, it was actually quite successful where we would get a lot of questions um, about kind of, I want to do this project, how do I get started? And, um, but as far as like actually scanning something for it, I, I, I don't, I don't think, uh, attendees tended to bring their own material. Yeah. Um, actually, we seeing ours. <laughs> yeah, we actually did try to do an archives roadshow <laughs> one year, but yeah, you're asking people to travel with their stuff, and then they're bringing they're bringing stuff, and then they're collecting stuff. So that also d didn't work. Um, I think I heard from some of you, uh, at least the ones that started early on, is that there was a bit of surprise with the turnout and the interest. Um, is, did participating in the Archives Bazaar change the way in which you think of yourself as an archivist and comparing you know, the people you speak to at the Archives Bazaar versus who you might encounter in your day-to-day -day work? Uh, has that sort of shifted anybody's perspective of archival work? Um. I don't know that it's um, shifted it as much as verified how um, useful it is to get and helpful it is to get out there and to the community um, because I work at right at a university and so I'm used to seeing um, students and faculty members and even your more seasoned researchers in special collections but being out in the um, at the bazaar you um, encounter just like everyday folks looking to learn more about um, the region's history and how to collect the region's history and so it kind of verified for me that we need to kind of step out of our um, our gates and off our campuses more and get into uh, the community I, I agree. Uh, so this is a rare opportunity where all of us is he are here. So I, I want to make sure that if you've got questions for your fellow Archives Bazaar coordinators, this would be a great time to share some of the questions you might have or comments. We have a, a few minutes, so why not? 
Well, I've gotten some really great ideas from the your descriptions of your <laughs> bazaars. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, ours is still rather small, and um, uh, we focus just on um, lectures and um, exhibitors. We did a walking tour. Um, I'm curious for those of you who didn't ask an archivist um, program and the oral histories on site, how those, um, how you set them up and what the um, response was to those. I'm looking at you, Daniel. Didn't you have an oral history booth or was that Houston? Well, we did have an oral history booth, but we, I, I thought this question was about ask an archivist. Um, oh. What was it, Patricia? For either, for either one. Either one. So I can, I can answer the oral history one. Yes, we, we had a, a, a full slate um, every time it's, it's about, but we, of course, so long we have about four to six slots per archives bazaar. And um, yes, each one of them was used and it went as far as I know very well, they've been archived at the Austin History Center. We've used the equipment um, every time we've actually ended up offering the equipment, or rather the History Center offers the equipment to be used by, by other people. Um, so I, I can say it has been successful. I think they also host them from the Austin History Center's website. So I, I wanted to ask, uh, Patricia brought up a very uh, it, it almost sounded verbatim to our problem, but there's always been the problem of venue. And I know that James talked about how it just sort of wanders around depending on who's willing to, um, or rather what they can find at the time. But, but yes, uh, parking, size, outdoor, indoor, all those things are a factor. And we spend probably a good three to four months every time trying to find a better venue. And um, the, the, let's see, the, the first one was a surprise because it was uh, far outstripped what we thought was uh, the attendance and the next two were okay and then this time we finally moved it to a different place uh, but we weren't it's like every time is a completely new experience and you don't know what's going to happen and and there's a degree of uncertainty uh, that happens every year that's both exciting and you know anxiety driven so if if um, I guess it, I suppose it's more of a comment does everybody have the same problem? Uh, for us in El Paso, um, finding a good venue has been a problem. Um, Las Cruces has been great with the Farm and Ranch Museum, but El Paso, um, when we had it in 2018 um, at the University of Texas at El Paso, uh, we had it at the large room in the student union and the space itself was great. It was the problem with parking. Um, there was just very limited parking uh, mm. on campus. And um, so for us, we were trying to find a place with better parking. Um, and then downtown El Paso construction, um, again, it's just, it comes down to parking. And, um, you know, most people don't want to pay for parking or parking meters, parking garages. So that kind of left out downtown El Paso. So yeah, that's something we've definitely struggled with with our El Paso location because when we first started doing the bazaar, the idea was we would alternate cities. Um, I guess kind of like what you do, James, that you know, one year being Las Cruces, another year being El Paso. Um, but we this year we strongly considered just having it in Las Cruces again because the venue was so great. Uh, and then, of course, we never really quite committed and then the pandemic hit. So, um, uh, and also I forgot to mention, uh, this week we decided we're doing a virtual bazaar too, um, on the 29th. So uh, please uh, check out our Facebook page for more information. Um, uh, the schedule is still being decided, but, um, but we figured even if it's just, you know, us BRAG members who are attending, you know, we, we have so much fun at these events. Um, and that was one thing, you know, talking about what surprised us. It was just, it was just so much fun. Um, one, I was surprised so many people came, but two, we just had such a good time because of course, you know, we're archives history geeks. We love seeing other people's displays. 
Definitely. That's definitely the, the spirit <laughs> in my experience with the archives bazaar. It's just such a rush. Um, and, and fortunately, and I should, I forgot to mention, we usually have a post archives bazaar reception that has generously been offered by the Dean of the USC libraries, Dean Catherine Quinlan. And it's, it, it, it's just a great spirit to see your fellow, you know, custodians of archives get together and have a beer and talk about what we did for the day. Uh, so it's great. But um, with that, I want to say thank you. And I actually have to do a special shout out to Daniel because I know I was told that you were the one that really, you know, blazed the trail for for those that <laughs> from, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth and Austin and Bragg and Oklahoma. So thank you for that. And um, uh, uh, Persusia and Crystal also thank you for being here and for you spending your Saturday talking about the Archives Bazaar. Um, so yeah, hopefully I will get to do the tour, the Archives Bazaar tour one year where I get to visit all of you and um, take swag and t-shirts from each event. <laughs> so with that, thank you everybody for coming and um, we'll see you at an Archives Bazaar near you. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank for, you for having okay. me. Thank you. And I, I will say that I am I was just one small person in a in a, 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 a group of about five people that, that started this in Austin. So it wasn't just me, but I appreciate that. All right. Great.